Um, so my question is regarding like making progress with this, um, with self-compassion. Like, uh, I think I would say I've, I've been more like practicing it more seriously in the past year. Um, and it feels like it's more steps backward than forward. Hmm. So just wondering, like, um, like, yeah, like, what do you do when you're not making progress? You keep working. I mean, evolution and one's personal evolution is not a straight line, you know, as it turns out. And sometimes when you expose the soft underbutt, the soft underbelly, so to speak, it's actually harder, right? I, it takes courage to hang in there, you know, with it. But I think that a continual uh, dose of generous kindness to yourself is what's critical. And I think that part of what's really important here is to recognizing that for each of us we have different aspects of ourselves and there's going to be one part that's really critical right it's going to get over it whatever i don't know what your critical voice is but most people have extremely critical inner voices right and to also recognize that that's not who you are right so part of it is to disidentify you know from that and just to see that as a particular character who's wounded right and sometimes it's hard to see that that someone who is super aggressive and hostile is actually wounded, right? But that's also true with one's own self aspect, right? That and how do you actually go? Huh? What is going on with you? That you are so harsh right now. And generally, you can get into some type of dialogue there. So, well, because you haven't done anything to take care of yourself in all these years. I mean, it has something in there that's on some level if you really go beneath the surface it's trying to get you to be better and i, I oftentimes look at these what we call traitor characters as they're they're misguided but they have a positive intent right and to start looking underneath the harshness but i do think that the core part of it is kindness and i i wish you you know a, you know really good luck, you know, in your journey, because I know for me, it's been quite a journey in this territory. And I'm pretty confident that as much as you're speaking for yourself, you're speaking for a lot of other people here. So thank you for the courage for speaking up. Thank you. A nice smile there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I'm going to take just one more. I'm going to have time for questions and answers or responses, if they have none, if they can be answers exactly. Uh, after I give this talk, I'm going to take one more, one more right now, and then uh, feel free to step forth uh, in a little bit when I'm finished with the talk. So, Rachel, you're on, and you're muted. Hi. Can you? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking my question. Okay. I just want to tell you a brief experience. Um, I was out walking about a week ago in the forest, and this huge bear was literally behind me oh but I was completely unaware of this and at the end of the trail this man was waiting and he calmly told me a huge bear had just crossed behind me and he shows me a picture of it because of COVID I didn't want to get too close to him but I you know I kind of see it I seem like I'm okay about it but later when he sends me the text of this bear you know that's when I sort of get into this really freaked out <laughs> sort of mode you know just just uh, kind of got terrorized but I was okay until that moment right. and I was wondering if you have a comment about that because I'm sure this relates on some deep level on what we're talking about thanks I mean I can go all kinds of places you know with that so I again I don't know you mm -hmm. right but you can imagine where that could trigger some old implicit memory non non-declarative memory around you were just lollygagging along and then there's actually a threat there that you were completely unaware of and i can so i can imagine where that would track back you know into your unconscious there but how many times has that happened where you've been naive not paying attention you know to potential threats again i don't know this for sure but yeah, that's yeah, see, I'm I'm pretty hyper vigilant, and I worked in the hospital, so I'm extra hyper vigilant. So, well, well maybe yeah, maybe that's related to it. That's there's some some way that you're carrying some stress trauma 
you know, in your body, in your being from those experiences. I mean, you, let's face it, when you're, when you're a healthcare provider and you're in these very threatening situations, maybe not even towards yourself, but other people feel threatened. And because of emotional contagion, we're picking up other people's mm -hmm. threat energy. And it's very easy to just internalize that. Mm -hmm. you know, part of what's challenging about being human is like, is it your energy? How much you pick up? How much you pick up from your parents? How much you pick up from your teachers? How much you pick up from your classmates? I mean, we, we don't live in some glass tube out here. That it's like our our brains are permeable. All right. So thank you. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into this talk. And again, I, I welcome your questions, responses uh, in a little bit. So I wanna wanna share with you some about relationships here, because you know we we all live in a world of relationships, and I'm I'm in this world. Uh, so so far, and so I've I've had both a personal and professional interest and focus on relationships. So I'm uh, I'm 69 years old, a year younger than Rick, and about to turn 70 and a half a year. And I've been really on this path, a relationship path, for pretty much 50 years, you know, at least probably more than that. And I I feel like I've been part of the slow learner school and maybe some of you can relate to the slow learner school uh, in relationships I've gotten much better at it over the years I, I I was someone who because of my own trauma my father dying and I'm not going to go into my whole history just because of time not because of of reluctance but I I developed a level of anxiety that my first therapist uh, thought and didn't tell me at the time was similar to people who he saw hospitalized. And that was when I was 20, 21, 22. So it was a very, very long time ago. I literally couldn't look anyone in the eyes at that time. I was really panicked. And that that person who was so threatened, traumatized, still lives inside of me. You know, that is still a part of me. But I recognize that that's a part of me. It's not all of me because I've changed a lot. I've grown. I've I've added new neural pathways, you know, as it were. And I'm and I'm saying this because I really believe that at any point in life, you can be changing. I can say that I have I've changed at least as much in my 60s as I did most of my life. You know, just, just to say that, because I'm I'm pretty confident that some of you are sitting out there and go, I am too old. There's no way that's gonna happen for me. And I'm here to say, if you believe that, you're right, you know, for sure. But you also won't challenge yourself if you believe that. And so you have to really kind of be open you know, to the territory. And, and the reality is that most of our joys and pain in life are in relationships. I oftentimes think of it about the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. It's probably about 9,763 that are related to pains you know, joys and pain related in relationships, you know, and so just note that even all of the questions or the, the reflections that people shared so far, they're all relational. What happened in relation, even with, like the, you know, Kathleen with your three-year-old granddaughter, you know, it's, it's a relationship there because we actually come to know ourselves and to be ourselves and really to evolve ourselves in relationship. Now, of course, we have our self-practices. I'm imagining that most or all of you meditate or have some type of meditation practice, as do I. And then and sitting and walking and being with yourself is really a critical part of it. And you probably notice that when you're meditating, that you're oftentimes thinking about other people and other relationships, like the default mode network, you know, the social brain, because we're wired to connect. We are absolutely wired to connect. And we know that from modern neuroscience, and I'm pretty confident that Rick has talked about this or other people have talked about it, so I won't go into a big story about that. But I, I do think that it's we, we've lived in challenging times, and there may, may well be that every time has been challenging because it always involves people, and with people there are vulnerabilities, there's, there's death hanging out there waiting. You know, it's been said that all Buddhism is, is created around two fundamental truths. One is that we're all going to die. And the second is we don't know when that's going to happen. Right? And so this, that's part of what we live in this, the vulnerable zone. And that's just a part of life. And part of what I really think about 
a lot these days is really the epidemic of loneliness that's occurring. I'm pretty confident that there are a bunch of you out there who feel lonely, you know, who don't feel so connected, and it's it's painful. The Surgeon General has literally said that we are living in an epidemic of loneliness these days, and it's and there are health factors involved with that. And so we're really looking at this territory of how to feel, you know, more connected and how to, to some degree, mitigate and minimize, you know, an experience of loneliness, which is a part of life, right? And I do think that when you do feel lonely, to care for yourself is really a, a critical point there. And part of my own, you know, personal, I think, professional sadness is the world tends to be in general, pretty harsh. You know, get over it. For guys, man up, grow a pair. But it's not so easy for anyone, right? You know, man, woman, gender fluid. I mean, it, it's it's challenging. And so there's seems even in our political discourse a, a dearth of compassion. And that's why, like, I'm I'm so so for you know the Global Compassion Coalition. Those of you here, look. You know, who are not involved, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. But the reality is that when we think, most of us at least think about connecting, there's ambivalence about it, right? It's like, I want connection, but I've also suffered in connections. I want to feel loved and loving. I've also felt scorned, you know, and burnt at times. So it's natural to have a kind of approach avoidance, you know, to relationships. Um, most of us have, even if we're living with someone, you know, as a as a mate, have approach avoidance because you know it's it's not simple. You know, it could be someone growls at you, you know, or you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. So moods and and you know, relational encounters are you know super challenging for sure. Now, I I think about uh, Joseph Ledoux. Joseph Ledoux, who those of you who don't know that name, he was the one who. Uh, research the amygdala and probably heard about emotional hijacking, how our brains get hijacked and go into reaction mode rather than response mode. And he said that survival is not just something we do in the presence of a wild beast or a bear, right, as it were. Social situations are often survival encounters. And I think part of the, what's really challenging about being human is that we experience anxiety in social situations. Now, some people have extreme social anxiety and even phobias about it. It's the rare person who doesn't have some anxiety about social situations. And why is that? You know, because the system that is, is related to physical dangers is connected to the one that's related to social dangers and psychological dangers. And so when you think about it, the, the threat of ostracism, being rejected, being abandoned, triggers unconsciously a, a threat of being thrown out of the tribe, right? And since we're tribal beings and our brains haven't changed so much since hunter-gatherer times, those social threats can activate anxiety. Anxiety is directly related to survival. If we, and we have to have anxiety because if we didn't have any, we wouldn't pay attention to threats, but most of us have our anxieties on overdrive. Now, Daniel Goldman, he said, threats to our standing in the eyes of others are almost as powerful as, as those to our very survival. And so I, I really like you to take that seriously, you know, in the sense that most of us shame ourselves when we feel anxious around other people. You know, go, what's wrong with me? I should get over myself. It's just, what's the big deal? Why am I getting on my own case? But when you really get and go peel beliefs beneath the surface, you know, it's totally understandable. You know, I I remember years ago when I went to a, a picnic that uh, these two, this couple had when my wife was gone. Every year they send this email, we're having a picnic. It's in Marin County in California. And, and one year I decided to go, she was gone. I went to this picnic and I drove up to this picnic and I was sitting there in my car and I looked out and I saw people, right? It was a picnic out there. And I suddenly got this burst of anxiety. I mean, it was, it was intense. And I, and it was just part of me, I was like, just go, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to stay here. Right. And, and I, and I, 
I, I feel almost teary with this because it was at that moment that I that I realized how much I had changed. Because when you think like you think about the journey that the Mary Oliver poem, where she said there was a new voice that you suddenly recognized as your own, there was for me because this voice said, you know, Daniel, that's totally understandable. You don't know who's here. There's stranger danger. You're wired. You're you're a human animal wired, you know, to be a little bit concerned about strangers. So it's perfectly natural and normal that you would feel anxious, even very anxious in this situation. And it was amazing because literally when that happened, my anxiety dissipated, right? Because that was a moment of self-compassion. And, and that was so different from what I, what I used to be. But it was like, come on, get over yourself. Here you are, you're a psychologist. How many years of therapy have you had? And, and you're going to get scared going to a picnic? Give me a break. You know, that was the voice I had. You know, and so I'm not saying that voice is completely gone, but, you know, it's really, really different. And it's really different because I practiced a lot. And I think that that's one of the key parts of this. I think a lot of people will try something once or twice. I think about my nephew. He said, I asked him about meditation. He said, I tried it once and it didn't work. I go, oh, great. <laughs> you know, like, seriously, like. As I kind of joke when I see some guys at the gym and I see you're back again, it didn't work the last time. You know, I mean, we have to practice. That's part of the deal on this planet. It doesn't just come naturally or easily. You know, you have to work at it. So when I, as I was thinking about this whole territory of relationships, which I do think about quite often, and I've just done a lot of work with people, you know, in relationships, myself included, there were three areas that came up to me. I don't think they're the only areas in relationship, but I do believe that the practice of these will make a huge difference in your life, you know, which is really awareness and pre awareness and presence of yourself, you know, in relation to others, you know, that you're present with yourself. And I, I think that when you look out in the world, presence is rare. <laughs> you know, I, I, I see uh, parents, you know, with their children and they're on their phones. People are so distracted. You know, maybe always on some level, but maybe more so right now. And to give someone your full attention when you're not on your phone, you're not doing something else. And, and that is a practice, right? Bringing yourself forward, feeling present in yourself, feeling and giving your presence, the gift of your presence to someone else. Wow, that is awesome. Also, appreciation. Most of us don't get much appreciation. I think the Dalai Lama said, the roots of all goodness lie in the soil of appreciation for goodness. And William James, great American psychologist said, the deepest principle of human nature is a craving to be appreciated, right? Now I work in organizations also, and I can tell you that one of the biggest things I always hear is I don't feel appreciated. That That is a bigger currency than money, you know, for most people feeling appreciated. And appreciation begins at home also, you know, your own self-appreciation. I can tell you that it's pretty vulnerable to appreciate yourself. You know, I've I've led a whole bunch of workshops over the years, and, and there are times when I've used, done a, done a process in the workshop where I've had people say in front of a group that they've been with for two, three, four days, so people have gotten to know each other, and they'll say in this group what they appreciate about themselves. Right? Spend two minutes only talking about what you appreciate about yourself. No self-criticism, no, no excuses for anything else. Yeah, you got that. No, just what you appreciate. And it's super vulnerable. And then they get only appreciations from other people. Now, a lot of times we think in relationships that the vulnerable things that we share with others are our are criticisms, our upsets, you know, with them, what we want to be different. And that's true. That is vulnerable. There's no question about that. And I think that we have a dearth of appreciations. And I think it's super sad. Uh, I, I, am, I am really a strong believer in really practicing appreciation. It's one thing 
to feel appreciation for somebody else. It's another to share that with them. And I think as I've seen, when I ask people about how much are you showing your appreciation of others, it's usually pretty, pretty weak, frankly, or pretty low. And I want to share something with you that I was mixed about sharing because I didn't want it to be like, oh, aren't you great? Or like you're showing off about what you did and how, how you showed appreciation. But I wanted, but I got over that because I think it's important. I was at an event on Saturday night, which some of you may know of California Institute of Integral Studies. I, I was on the board. I'm an alum you know, of it. And there was an alum event. And so I went to, I hadn't seen some people for a while. And there was a woman there who worked in the office, her name's Cynthia, uh, beautiful, lovely woman, she's African, always African-American woman who's just always got the biggest smile, very friendly. And she was super friendly to me and it was very touching to me. And I guess I've come to a point in my life where my emotions are pretty close to the surface. And it must be fairly obvious. But I, I thought about her afterward and I thought, you know what? I want to, I'm going to write her an email and tell her how much I appreciate her. You know, and I, and I was kind of like, I've thought about those things at times. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I'm not, I don't have a should about it. But I'm saying this because you may want to think about people in your life that you, you have touched your heart, that you appreciate, and it would be awesome for them to hear from you, right? Because that is a practice also. So what I wrote her was I said, hey, Cynthia, I find myself reflecting on the evening last night inclusive of none other than you. Two reflections. One, I was moved by your emotion toward me and deeply felt your all in caps big heart. You truly touched my heart. And two is, by the way, this was um, uh, a sharing for somebody else who was retiring after over 40 years, who uh, sadly got COVID and wasn't even there, but they were doing videos of her. And, and I said, you're sharing too and for Kathy, was full of love and soul, kindness and spirit, humor and depth. And I said, CIS is lucky to have you on board and you are lucky to be there. I like the Bantu definition of luck, opportunity plus preparedness. Gosh, you're lucky. So, and, and I, so I wrote that to her and I felt really good. And she wrote me a sweet, appreciative you know, email back. And I, I wanna live in a world, frankly, you know, where I want to live in a world where there's that kind of openness and where we where we show that people matter to us. You know, they're not just objects out there. You know, I, I think about Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, and he he spoke about I thou relationships versus I it relationships. I that you are a subject. You know, you matter. You're significant. And so oftentimes people are treated as objects, I its. And I think one of the things that, that touched me when, in, when reading Buber was that he said that the I in an I-thou relationship is completely different from the I in an I-it relationship. Because when, you're, when the other is a thou to you, you are a thou. You are a thou to yourself. You are a self. But if, if the other is an it, it's just transactional. You're an object yourself. That I is an object. And then the last part I want to talk about is compassion. You know, compa we do live in a dearth of compassion, I think, on this planet. And to see others as Tao's and to see that, you know, life is challenging. You know, there's no question about that. I mean, Buddhism is, is based in part on, like, suffering, right? And how to, the alleviation of suffering. You know, obviously, when we want to open up to joy and pleasure, but it's really hard to be in those more exalted realms when we're just suffering all the time. And to be, to show compassion toward others, huge. I was in the gym the other day and there's a guy there who I've seen there for years. I've never spoken with him very much, friendly, you know, just hi, how you doing kind of thing. And we happened to be in the stretching area at the same time and it, he, he, he said, he just told me that he's, he goes to the gym every day. I said, really? You go every day? And he said, and then he told me that his wife died uh, in September. And he was with her for 47 years. And it happened suddenly. 
I just felt compassion for him. And just in that moment, you know, I said, wow, it's really, that's tough. And I just, I showed him compassion. I felt it and I showed it to him. And I, it felt like we had a, a nice little interchange. And, and part of what I'm sharing these particular stories rather than stories with friends or family or people who I'm in you know, regular contact with is I think that there are opportunities for connections all the time with people. You know, it could be someone in your coffee shop. You know, it could be someone in the grocery store. You know, many of us, we go through our lives with these, with these implacable, you know, guarded fronts to us, like don't, you know, with our iPhones on, our, iPhones on and just keeping other people at distance. And I'm not saying you should go out there and start a conversation with every person on the street. That's not my point. My point is that there are people all over the place, right? And if we only limit ourselves to the people who are like closer to us, we have less potentials for connections. And, and indeed, part of what really makes a difference in terms of, of a satisfaction in life is having a large swath, you know, of life, of being open in the world. And God knows, you know, the world needs our openness. And I and I I'm going to say a couple more things and then I'm going to open it up to Q Q and A or reflections. I really believe that it's important to have a type of um, relationship vision. And I don't, when I say relation, a lot of times people think, oh, you're talking about a mate relationship. No, I'm talking about relationships. And I know for me, as someone who is a recovering, very reactive person, having grown up with a major raise your father, internalized levels of hostility and anger and reactivity that are still a part of me, you know, but I don't tend to lead with those versus how I used to be, you know, and that. I've really gotten clear about what kind of person I want to be. And even though I may have a reaction to like, you know, screw that person, I'm going to get that. And, and I have, a, I have a, a level of intensity, you know, in this particular character here that can go off on people. And I have historically, but I, I don't do that anymore because I've gotten clear about, I don't want to hurt people at a minimum, you know, and I, and I, so I, I can see that part of myself that wants to react. And I may react with a friend or something, just, like just let it out and then let it sit. And then go, how do I want to be? And I want to, I want to live and I want to lead, you know, with more openness and care and compassion and appreciation and not those reactive parts. And so I've I think that for me historically, because I had so much shame about those reactive parts or about hurting people, you know, that I would kind of hold in and, and, and freeze you know, in certain ways. And now I feel like I have, I can see that part of myself and look at that part. And I think that part of, part of the importance of practice is that being able to really look at those different parts. And so when you have a part that's super self-critical, that's not who you are. It's a part of you, but it's not who you are. It's not your essence. Your essence is good, right? And so you want to be looking at these different parts and look at them versus from them. And so that's part of the point, and to me, part of the point of practice. So with that, I'd like to you know, open it up for sharing uh, questions. And so please use your virtual um, hand to ask questions. And Lynn from Calgary. Just some observations. This isn't a question, but the whole compassion thing. Um, first of all, it's the small things sometimes that really touch me when someone says a kind word or whatever, and you feel important and heard or seen. And so what I do, what I've been doing, but I started thinking about what I was doing is I'd always have a pocket full of fives on me. And I live in an area where there's a lot of street people, not all the time, but I go through McDonald's and invariably there's somebody needing. So I'll hand them a five. And it's Thomas Merton, I think Jack Cornfield quotes this, after being in a retreat, he came out from the retreat and he said, I saw that beauty in each human being and I needed to bow down. What I, I realized that you give them the five, 
and this person who is disheveled and right. troubled, right. you see that spark in them. And, and but you feel you feel seen as well. And it's so, so I call it a crash course in compassion. Carry mm. around a pocket full of fives. You mm. will feel, you will feel, I don't know, it's, and I don't mean that as sort of uh, phony. Those incidents have made my day often. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Because, you know, the giving is receiving in that regard, so you receive also in that. And that's part of what I, I really want to, to communicate is that the, the willingness to give to others is itself a gift, right? And also receiving the gift, right? Because most people aren't very good at receiving a gift that's offered to them. They go, oh, no, 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 it's no big deal. Or someone shows an appreciation for someone going out of the way. Ah, you would do it, no, no, no biggie. And it's, it's like, it's actually when somebody's offering that appreciation to somebody else, that itself is vulnerable, right? Because how is, how is the other person going to receive it? So vulnerability mm -hmm. is this, it flows through everything, right? So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So George, George, you're a beautiful flower. Yeah, there's. Uh, I saw a question that was close to uh, something that I was interested in also at 7.06, uh, Elaine wrote, let me see if I can find it, was well, basically, do we have to find uh, compassion in ourselves before we find it? Uh, do you have to have that relationship within yourself before you can have it with somebody else? And it seems from my experience that a relationship with ourselves really goes out to all other relationships. So I just wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one in terms of do you need to be, for example, like really, really self-compassionate before you can be compassionate to others there are different schools of thought on that i mean it's that the jury's out in my mind yeah but i do think that it's very hard to sustain compassion for others if you're beating up on yourself i think you can be compassionate for others when you're not being compassionate for yourself but not in the long term right because self-criticism when you think about it is is the kind of the fight part. If you think about defensiveness, I, I'm 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 always thinking about kind of psychobiology and just you know we're human animals and we're we're, we're animals, right? I mean we're not we have we have uh, developed uh, corpus callosum as human animals, but you know the core of us is is reacting and is tribal and is you know threat based. You know, it's looking for opportunities and threats. I mean, this is part of being a human animal, right? And so I, th I think about defenses all the time, fight, flight, freeze, appease, and how easy it is to go into defensiveness. Unmitigated threats trigger defensive reactions, period. Like if you don't, if you don't intervene in some way in that, it will lead to a defensive reaction that will just keep going, right? And so when you think about self-hostility, self-rejection, self-criticism, that's like the fight part going inward. And so what's what happens inside, right? I mean, you're going to just open to that? No. What happens is that there's another part of one's being in the complexity of who they are that gets defensive and puts up a wall to that. And so there's this kind of dyadic relationship where the fight is internalized. If that's happening all the time, and for many of us, it's happening quite often, how, how are we going to be opening our hearts? And feeling compassion, you know, toward others consistently over a long period of time. I mean, to, to me, it's a rhetorical question because I don't think you can, because so much of the energy, you know, is going into that defense. And sometimes I think about for those of you who happen to be Trekkies or semi Trekkies, there is a a device called the cloaking device, you know, where when the USS Enterprise, I didn't think I was going to talk about Star Trek tonight, but when the US Enterprise is being attacked by an alien ship that they put on this cloaking device, which would make it invisible, right? And so it was very effective. 
However, it lost all other functions, right? And that's really what happens when we're in a defensive state. So I, I do think that the practice of self-compassion makes it so much easier really to give to others and to be compassionate toward others. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. All right, we have Naye, is that, is that how you pronounce it? I'm not sure. Oh, thank you very much. That was very touching what you said. And I want to say that, that it, that it was very nice to hear those stories. And on that same thought, I thought of sharing with, with you and with the group some websites that I visit as nourishment for this, for connection and inspiration. And just to, maybe you would like to, to check them out. One is Story Corps, where people talk, I don't know if you know about this site. Perfect. People talk about their pieces of life and they share, I, I think it's very touching. I, I can cry my eyes out of some of those stories. Um, the Forgiveness Project is another website, beautiful website. And uh, Green Renaissance is a page in, in YouTube. Uh, I really recommend it. May, so, may, I, may I ask you, if I may come in for a moment, I'm pretty sure yeah. people are gonna remember all these. Would you be willing to put those in the chat? I, I, I don't know if I can, I, I'm, I'm in, a, I, in, in a path and that's why I raise my hand because I know how to do this okay. in the path. Okay. Uh, so, so Story Corps, Green Renaissance, and the and the Forgiveness Project. Great. And sure, if you Google those, uh, they will come up. Great. Well, thank you very much. So, thank you very much. All right, Mary Lynn. So, I just wanted to um address the uh, something earlier that you were talking about in terms of parts and that once we can identify our parts um then we more easily realize they're not really who we are they're right. part of who we are but they're not all of who we are right um but you know and so that can be helpful to kind of get organized in your sense of being and and sense of self uh which i can do on on good days but on bad days where i'm flooded uh, such as the last few days, I've been completely flooded by, um, I have what's called, I, I just discovered that there's actually a term uh, or like sort of a sub-diagnosis of complex PTSD, which is uh, rejection trauma. And I definitely have extremely chronic rejection in my life. Um, and it's very severe when it happens. And it's basically in the realm of... Um, shunning, you know, public shunning, public shaming, uh, uh, you know, persecution, like, and I'm not talking complex, this is actual stuff that's been happening to me in my life, on a regular basis, whenever I join groups, or, you know, and so it could end up happening here, I wouldn't be surprised. But basically, I get completely flooded, it, it just uh, swamps me for several days, I'm thrown under the bus, and I am not in my, um, I'm not able to access any of my parts, it's, like my whole body is in trauma, I'm buzzing, like literally I feel like I'm shaking inside my inner body. And I'm just starting to feel a little bit better this evening, but I've been spending three days in this state. And there's no way I can access parts right now. Yeah. I'm I'm just flooded. So do you have anything you can say about I, when I, that happens? I, I tell you, honestly, I think the best thing to do would be work with a really good trauma therapist. I, I, I think oh, yeah. That, for those who can afford $180 or $200 an hour, that's right. not my situation, right. unfortunately. Sorry. So. I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to hear that, Mary Lynn. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, no, I'm, I'm, there's no easy answer to this. I mean, I can tell you that there are times with as much as I know and as, as much work as I've done on myself that a mood takes over and I don't have access to look like there's the also the hijacking uh is another term right. that's used right because exactly. the prefrontal cortex goes offline and yeah. it becomes like you're in your, yeah. your full body pain with trauma yeah. and you know i wish it weren't so like i wish i could just you know move on with my life and not have to talk about this and go and play pickleball or something right. you know but i get stuck with these things so today what i took is i can't take antidepressants because they cause suicidality 
Um, and, you know, there are things I can't take, but um, uh, what I what I did end up taking today, and it's a very rare event that I do, is just a small out of van, um, just to calm down, because yeah. I just was not coping. Yeah. And I get um, very suicidal in, the, in this state, because it's literally like, you want to jump out of a burning building, and mm. it's yeah. the only way to do it. And yeah. uh, it's very severe, and I just thought maybe you might happen to know of some sort of remedies and when you're just mm -hmm. not in touch with your parts at all. No, I mean, the only thing I would offer is really to put your hand on your heart, maybe do some self-compassion exercises, you know, meditations, but that that's, that's what I would recommend at this point, but I, I, I feel for you and I, you certainly will not be shunned here. So thank well, you. I hope not because I, I did get, um, um, thrown out of, uh, Tara Brax, uh, uh, Sangha group wow. uh, because they were telling me that this is, was not a place for therapy and I was sharing too much detail right. well, uh, and it wasn't yeah. appreciated so I I hesitate but I also am a very open okay. and honest person and I don't I don't feel I have to hide anything okay well thank you Marilyn I wish you the best thank you so much all right okay so Naomi in New York City huh Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I wasn't. Hello, it's so nice to be here. I feel fortunate, so fortunate to have discovered uh, this uh, group like over COVID, and uh, I get something out of it all the time. I started with meditation about 10 years ago in the Upper West Side with Alan Locus, I'm sure you know. Um, and every time I hear something, somehow it applies exactly to the way I feel at the moment. So talking about when I when you were talking about appreciating someone else, uh, I do that all the time. I have no problem with that. Today I read a letter. I, I wrote a letter about my senior center. I'm pushing 84. I'm going to be 84 in October, and so I go to the senior center and they appreciate it. I, I wrote how how important the work they did and how wonderful they did for all of us while we were isolated. And including now and how it uplifts me when I go and uh, join them all in, uh, you know, and today they had a you know, 4th of July party and all of that. So I don't have any problem appreciating others and others know. And I think I'm very popular and like right. of that. Right. The problem with myself is that unless I do that, I almost don't have a se sense of purpose in life. Uh, it, it's it's a little too much. I don't I don't hardly uh, give myself the compassion. And, and you spoke of that that we all do that. We don't give ourselves the compassion that we do for others. Um, like in the earlier speaker, you know, like I feel so needed and so appreciated when I do something for others. And I come from Judaism and Martin Buber and and the rest of the philo brilliant philosophers that we have. Um, so that's my problem is that is that I still get very angry with myself. And as I'm aging, there are fewer and fewer things that I do. I get tired more easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I waited yesterday. I was supposed to come to you in Los Angeles, a big wet family wedding. You know, uh, and, if, and I waited. If I may, if I may jump in for, for yeah. a moment here. Yeah. I mean, your, your particular experience is obviously your individual experience because you're you, right? And you're not anyone else nor is anyone else you. And I think you're speaking for a lot of people, you know, and, and that it's, it's really challenging to not be harsh on oneself. You know, and certainly, you know, there are some people who have a sense of their life purpose and they're on their path and they're always moving toward that. I don't think that's most people, right? And so I think that part of what the, the ongoing practice is, a, is about is kindness. You know, I, I think about uh, Theodore Rubin, nice Jewish philosopher type guy, you know, who said, um, wis he said, um, kindness is more important than wisdom. And the recognition of that is the beginning of wisdom. Wow. Right? Wow. And so I, as someone who grew up myself in a very harsh uh, environment, and I internalized harshness, you know, toward myself and toward others. I've seen over the years the the power of letting go, you know, and of, of seeing that 
that that sense of um uh harsh harshness and I see everywhere in the like it's, it's everywhere in the world and I, I oftentimes think about the Gandhi, you know, statement, like, be the change you want to see in the world. And I keep, when I was talking about earlier about having a certain kind of value vision, so I, I am always faced with that because there are things that are happening in this country right now that piss me off, that I'm very reactive to politically. And I'm pretty confident I'm not alone, you know, in this. And then I have to keep on... Hatred is not the answer. I don't care if it's on, you know, I'm certainly more left leaning for sure, but hatred anywhere is not the answer. When we still have to, you know, take action, I'm not saying just be not do anything, you know, in terms of uh, righting wrongs and injustices. But I, I just keep coming up to that the, the problem is hatred everywhere you look. And I'm working with and metabolizing our own hatred while taking action. Right. So I think about Rick, you know, for example, who started the Global Compassion Coalition and obviously done many things, great things in the world. And he's not motivated by hatred. You know, he's got reason because he's had his own issues, you know, challenges in life. But I, I can see that very directly how it comes up and how quickly he metabolizes it. And I think that's a good model. Like how quickly can any one of us metabolize hatred even toward ourselves right maybe maybe that's the most difficult <laughs>